Thank you, oh, Stella. Yes. Okay, I want to start with just one message, one takeaway. If you're gonna take away one thing from today, let it be this. Spectrography is easier than you think. And if you can take that away from today, then you're gonna be way ahead of where I was two years ago <laughs> because I thought spectrography must be one of the hardest things that you could do. And also, I thought that you needed expensive gear to do it. Luckily, I found Tom's website and uh, I got sold on the star analyzer. So the expensive gear part went out the window. I took out my star analyzer, my mom's DSLR. I didn't know how to use it. <laughs> um, I just set it out on the balcony under some dark skies, let it roll. And this is a picture I got. And that's a, that's a beautiful image. I mean, don't get me wrong. But if you look at those spectra, well, the bright ones are overexposed here in Orion, but if, even if we look at one that's properly exposed and you profile it, which is something that I didn't know how to do at the time, but here we'll make the graph anyway, there's not really any features in there. This over here is the star. Spectrum's pretty smooth. And that's not what I was hoping for. Um, I may have not known how to make the graphs, but I did know at least that I should be looking for the spectral features and I wasn't seeing any. It was kind of discouraging and so for a while, I kind of just stopped. I left it, quit spectrography. And then one day my mom came up to me <laughs> and she said, hey, Lauren, I heard about this, this conference they're gonna have, a, a workshop where you learn to do spectrography. And I took a look at it and I said, no, that's, that's way too expensive. It's like 350 bucks for a ticket and travel expenses and everything. I mean, I don't even know if I'm gonna learn anything from it. She said, it's not too expensive. This is for your career. Thanks, mom. Thanks for saying that because I learned more in those three days than I would have in three years otherwise. And uh, if you were there at SMSW2, then you might remember me from uh, when we were going to go up the mountain to do our, our test spectra, but then the conditions weren't good. So I was too impatient with every, all the wonderful stuff I've been learning. And I said, I'm just gonna go out by the pool and take some spectra anyway. I had that old DSLR, had the star analyzer, didn't have a way to keep it on the front, but I did have a coffee cup. So <laughs> I just cut that up. And most importantly, I thought by now, I had this here, which is a, a tracker, a star tracker. And I thought, well, this is gonna be better than my telescope, because my telescopes can't track. They, they're not gonna be able to get hardly any exposure time at all, right? So I'll just use this tracking DSLR to take my spectra. Went home, I started a project where I was uh, surveying a wolf ray at star, easy Canis Majoris, and that is here. It's not the bright one, um, <laughs> it's the faint one right, right above that. I don't know if you can see it, but it's got a really faint little emission line you can see there, maybe one right there, maybe a faint continuum, right? So I was hopeful when I saw this, I was like, oh yeah, if, if my eye can see it, surely it's gonna look great. And once I make a graph out of it, no, sorry. Hardest lesson you're gonna learn about spectrography is that your eye is always going to see the spectra better than the software is. The human brain is just so good at, at noise reduction. Can't, the computer can't do that. So if I go ahead and make a graph out of it, again, there's not, there's not really much there. You got the star, you got the one emission line, and that's about it, the rest of it's noise. And I was pretty disappointed because this was 20 minutes worth of 30 second exposures. I was like, that's plenty of exposure time. If I can't get this, this seventh magnitude star, and luckily <laughs> around that time, uh, I got a camera for my birthday, an, an astronomy camera, and it's a monochrome CMOS camera, like the kind that they're making nowadays for planetary cameras. And I thought, well, I know, I know you're supposed to be able to do this with video, like, like Tom says. So I'll put my star analyzer on the camera and I'll put it in my telescope. And I'll just see what I can see. Maybe I can get some magnitude zero stars like Vega um, or Arcturus, that kind of thing. Maybe, maybe it'll be enough light to see that. I got a lot more than magnitude zero stars, and that's what I'm here to talk to you about today. After a long period of optimization, this is now my spectrography setup. I've got an eight inch dob, that's an Orion X-T8. I've got a camera, laptop to control it with, finder scope so I can 
help you know find myself and um a chair because it get it gets tiring being out there all night long if you don't have somewhere to sit that's an important part of the kit and uh as with the camera end of things let's see a close up so here's the camera that i'm using now it's a cool camera but it doesn't have to be uh any any astronomy camera should work then i've got some spacers because i've also got over here on the end a prism that brings the spectrum back onto the optical axis all from the side back onto the center and it reduces the off axis aberrations by doing that so it sharpens up the spectrum so to take advantage of that sharpness i have a lot more extenders than you normally see people using um, but you can definitely use that much spacing when you have one of these prisms and then right on the end here is the diffraction grating itself okay so now i'm going to show you how I capture my spectra using all of that kit. All right, here's what it looks like when I first line up a target at the beginning of the night. There's several things wrong here. It's out of focus and the grating is not rotated so that it's perpendicular to the camera. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm just pulling out the camera from the focuser of the telescope, making little adjustments to the grating on the end of the nose piece until it runs straight horizontally. That makes things so much better later in software. Okay, next step, rotate the camera with a Dobsonian. See how fast that star is moving? Put my cursor there and I let it drift towards the right so I can see if the spectrum's going towards the right and I want it to go down, then I have to do a 90 degree rotation to the camera, same as I want the spectrum to go. All right, next up comes focusing and that can be tricky uh, with a slitless spectrum like this that's shooting across the screen because your telescope's not tracking. So uh, I do that by messing around with the settings, I zoom in, um, and then there's these telluric lines on the red end of the spectrum from Earth's atmosphere. And those are really good lines to focus on when you're at a fairly high uh, spacing and resolution, because those lines will just start to resolve when you hit a good focus, like here. Who knows if you can see that through the compression, but there we go. The water band has just sharpened up into individual lines. And then I lock the focuser. Uh, my focuser, it's got a lock screw on it. Yes, I took it off the scope for this. <laughs> um, and if you do that, then if you turn the knob or you apply pressure on the focuser, the draw tube won't move. And that will help when you have to rotate the camera again later on. You do that for each different part of the sky you visit. So here I've just star hopped to my target, which is P Cygni. You can tell because it's got that bright hydrogen alpha emission line there. Um, positioning it in the upper left, which is where I like to have my drift start. And then doing the test with the cursor, putting it over a feature and watching which way the feature goes. Went a little bit towards the lower left, so I'm rotating it a bit. There we go. Now it's going straight down. So I'll line it up again in the top and start my capture. Now for settings, normally I like to keep the gain on maximum for most stars. The brightest stars, you don't wanna do that, but going down to about mag nine, when you're not using any tracking, you're just gonna be stacking hundreds of frames together. That's the whole point of the method. <clears throat> and so if you have the maximum gain, that helps you to swamp the read noise and the read noise of VWO cameras does go down a bit with max gain. Okay, so next up, let's talk about one of the main draws of the drift scanning method, which I just showed you. And that is, you don't need that much equipment. You probably already have a Dobsonian, but, or at least any telescope, it doesn't have to be a Dob. But if you don't, then you can get an eight inch Dob like mine for about $300. Um, the camera is probably gonna be your largest investment because these modern CMOS cameras aren't that cheap yet. Um, and this one that I started out with is the, cheapest one that I've used and therefore can recommend, but probably like a webcam would work. And if you try that and it does work, then please send me some examples so I can start putting that in my talks. But um, anyway, the, the, this camera is about $370 new. Um, the prism is optional, but uh, if you want to push your resolution and go up above say R300, you can go up to over R1000 if you, if you use a lot of extenders then the prism is $77 and the star analyzer 100 is 140. So altogether, that's a kit that gets you resolution that is comparable to a 
low resolution slit spectrograph like like Percy was showing. Um, and the cost of entry is not that high for that. Okay, so you remember easy Canis Majoris, that wolf ray at star that I tried to survey with my DSLR. Well, I came back to that with a 12 inch Dobsonian. And so here's a comparison. Got the DSLR spectrum down here and the Dobsonian spectrum up here. And man, what a difference. I mean, just, just look at the difference that sheer aperture makes. The DSLR had over 20 times as much exposure and it was track exposure too, not, uh, I think it was a third of a second that I did for the 12 inch. But just look, you can see all of these minor emission lines that were completely lost in the noise with the DSLR spectrum. It, also, the monochrome camera helps with an extended range into the UV uh, and the infrared where the DSLR would cut out even if there was uh, sufficient exposure. All right, I'm going to run through real quick some more examples, just in case you weren't convinced of the method already. Uh, here's Vega, which is probably one of the first uh, stars that you're going to take a spectrum of, especially if you start around this time of year when it's so high overhead. It's an A05 reference star. And when I, when I first started, um, I could only see three or four Balmer lines using that, that DSLR. Um, and now I've got it up to the point where you can count alpha, beta, gamma, delta, epsilon, zeta, eta, theta, and on down. If you zoom in, they just keep on going. I think that's, that's pretty cool. Uh, the tellurics also are, are, once you reach these resolutions, you can start seeing some detail in those molecular bands in Earth's own atmosphere. Um, okay, next one, one of my favorite stars, RT Virginis. Uh, and this one is radiating almost entirely in the infrared. I mean, just look at that. Look at those, those titanium oxide bands uh, that Percy was showing. Here's the tellurics are over here and they look horridly deep <laughs> um, when there's that much light behind them. And uh, in fact, the visible region, you see it gets squashed down so low due to that infrared scaling the screen. I went ahead and I multiplied. So that's what this gray is here is, is multiplied so you can see the vis visual region better. Okay, and uh, last one, this is a spectrum of Arcturus that I took a couple months ago and I'm including it because the resolution measured at around R1000. Um, and I was able to get that all because of the wide sensor size of my current camera. I was able to get that all in the field of view at the same time together with the star. So that's about, that's about the max that you can do unless you had a camera with like a ridiculous size sensor um, would be R1000 if you want to keep the star in view too. Uh, and if you zoom in, uh, then you can actually see some more features that were hidden due to the scaling. The sodium doublet is clearly split. Uh, so is the magnesium triplet. Now you'll see that they are more clearly split up here on the image than they are in the graph. And yeah, like I said, the human eye is better at seeing detail than computers are. Okay, so those have been some examples. Now I'm going to talk about the downside, the main downside to drift scanning, which is that although your limiting magnitude is so much better than a DSLR, because you're going from a one inch aperture up to however big your telescope is, still not as good as if you had the same size telescope tracking. So um, things like supernovae, those are generally out of reach, at least for my scale telescope, which is an eight inch. Um, and I, I shoot from within the city. So I, I generally don't go fainter than Mag 9. But I made an exception the other day for Nova Cassiopeia 2020, because I really wanted to see a Nova. I caught it at where it was almost at the peak, but it was still about magnitude 11 and a quarter. And it came out just too noisy. So that's, that's if you're wondering what happens if you try and shoot one of uh, the fainter targets, you'll probably get a spectrum that looks something like this. Pretty much just noise. You have a bit of a continuum, but. Okay, so to recap, I remember being at SMSW2, the, the spectrography workshop. And I remember sitting there in one of the presentations and just feeling so close and yet so far because now I was learning all that I needed to do, all, all that I needed to know to do what I love. But I also was learning kind of that you could only do it if you had a slit spectrograph and tracking and guiding. 
And I didn't have any of that, and I don't have hope of getting that soon. And so I, I thought, well, maybe someday. But thankfully, there were some people at the workshop who encouraged me to pursue Spectra with my star analyzer. And I'm so glad that I did. And I'm so glad that I tried it out on my job and I was stubborn with making it work because now I've discovered a way. I mean, there might be other people out there doing it, but I haven't heard. I have personally discovered for myself a way that I can get really great Spectra for not much cost. It's a fast setup, uh, even faster teardown. And maybe now I can share this and other people who have been kind of interested in Spectra for a while, like I was, but thought it was out of range, well, maybe now those other people can take cool Spectra for themselves and get the enjoyment from the hobby. So to forward that goal, I have created a website uh, where I have a guide to drift scanning spectrography. It's detailed, it's simple language, goes step by step. And uh, if you just go to tiedieastronomer.com, you can either use that guide yourself if you're interested in learning, or if you know someone else who's interested in learning, then you can share it with them. All right, please, teaching is my thing. If you have any questions that aren't answered by that website and you are just, you wanna get into it, but you're not sure about it, just anything, you can write me, lauren at tiedieastronomer.com. And remember, you can go to that website to, to find the guide itself. So yeah, thank you for your time.